Hey there, this is Josh on the campus of Huntington University. You're listening to Rooted, an in-depth conversation with interesting people and topics that matter to the Forrester family. Make sure you subscribe to Rooted on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify. You can find us by searching Forrester Radio Rooted. Today, I'm joined by Amanda Morris Campbell. Amanda, thanks for joining me. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, so I just want to start off, uh, what is your role on campus? Uh, so my primary role is that I'm the director for the Sojourners program. So that largely entails um, supervising them, uh, spending time in mentorship with them, facilitating their events, and then I also work alongside our campus pastor, Mark Vincenti, with some chapel programming. Okay, and uh, how long have you held that position? So I have been involved with the Sojourner program since 2016 in some capacity as a supervisor. I've held my current role as their direct supervisor or primary supervisor since 2020. What made you decide to want to be in that position? So it's a little bit of a non-traditional story um, because I came on campus as a student in 2012 as a freshman and then started in what used to be called the CMC program and is now called the Sojourner program um, in my sophomore year, so 2013 into 2014. Um, I was a worship leadership major at the time and then I got about three quarters of the way through my junior year and had the panic that so many college students have of, oh shoot, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Um, I am going to burn out, 100% it's gonna happen. And um, our former director of the program, Dr. Nori Friesen, was my supervisor, my mentor at the time. And as I'm having this panic in the middle of my second year as a CMC, um, he's like, okay, take a deep breath, we're gonna figure this out. And through the course of that discerning process, he asked me, um, so like, if you could do anything, money's not an object, no restrictions, what do you want to do? And kind of kidding, I was like, oh, I want to be a CMC forever. Like, I love this. (laughs) Um, And I was kidding. I was like, that's not a real job. And he's like, okay, let's do it. Um, So Dr. Friesen at the time was kind of heading towards retirement and was looking at like, okay, how do we help this program kind of um, naturally, organically transition into its next, next phase of life. So he suggested I look at our counseling graduate program here at Huntington and um, then come on as the graduate assistant for, at the time, the CMC program. So I did that until Dr. Friesen retired in uh, 2020. So there's a weird gap here and there, but you guys need to know all the weeds of that. <laughs> um, it's a weird situation. Um, so it really was about um, figuring out that I loved walking with people um, in specifically spiritual formation. And I know that sounds like such a pat answer for somebody in my role, but I really love sitting with people and helping them find their next step forward and figuring out where God is specifically showing up in their specific life at a specific time and getting like really nitty gritty and nuanced about those things. Um, I really enjoy that. So some of it was just kind of finding my way um, along my own path. But um, so I don't know that there was ever a moment that I was like, I'm gonna be the director but it, it kind of um, organically worked out that way. And I'm genuinely very thankful to the Lord every, week, <laughs> every day that this is what I get to do. Yeah. What was your experience as a CMC mm. or a sojourner? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, man, so I worked in Livingston. I was on Livingston first both the years that I served. Um, and one of the things I loved about that was getting to work with a partner. Um, Livingston Floors back then and now have two people in that job. So you get oh. to have a co. Uh, similar to the way the RAs do. And um, I love being part of a team. I, the people that I met in my first year as a CMC that I served on a team with are still some of my best friends. Um, one of those people introduced me to my now husband. Um, the, one of the other girls is like to this day, she lives down the street from me, I see her every week. Like they are my people. Um, and they really gathered around me during a really, my sophomore year was a pretty a uh, traumatic one, let's put it that way. Um, and they were the people who really rallied around and cared for me spiritually and relationally and sometimes physically, um, mm-hmm. making sure that I was taking care of myself. And I really saw Jesus through them and wanted to do that for other people and wanted other students that came after me to have that experience of like living alongside people who were also loving Jesus well and learning how to do that in really practical and tangible ways. Um, so for me, it was a lot less about like floor worship and programming. It was a lot about the people that I was serving alongside. Um, so that has definitely shaped the way I lead the program. The programming is totally secondary to um, the discipleship and the mentoring and the spiritual growth that I think we do. Um, not that our programming is not important. Our programming is definitely important. But it just it takes a maybe a passenger seat to 
the things that students are doing in my office and with each other and with the residents um, in relationship and how we kind of invite people forward into their walk with Jesus. So I think that sort of answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, because like, I guess when people do think about sojourners, it is a lot more about like, the, okay, they run the floor worship sure. and they help with events, but a lot of it also sometimes is just like being there for the students. Yeah, totally. When they, I mean, I have Brody as my uh-huh. sojourner and he's definitely- We love him. <laughs> he and yeah. I have definitely had conversations about things that I've struggled mm-hmm. with, so. Yeah, it's really interesting. We're in the middle of sojourner recruitment and interviewing now, and I ask two questions during, well, lots of questions, but two <laughs> of them that I asked during that, one of them is, you know, what is your understanding of the sojourner position? And I would say like 90% of the people start with a floor worship, which is totally fair and is totally like the most visible thing that people do. And then later I ask a question about like, um, you know, what are some of the things that you would be afraid uh, for a resident to come and bring to you? Because I do know that is a big part of it. People are bringing hard things to their sojourners and um, walking through that. And that's the stuff that people don't see. They don't see those 2 a.m. conversations that someone's having, um, that a sojourner is having with a student to walk them through a faith thing or a life thing. Um, And I think that's where a lot of the best formation and work of the Holy Spirit happens. So what is your favorite part of the job? So many favorite things. Um, so probably like top tier or the umbrella thing is I love being with my sojourners. Um, they will tell you like I am maybe mildly obsessed with them uh, <laughs> or maybe a lot more than mildly. Um, I just genuinely love being around them. They are some of the coolest people I get to know. and. So that shows up in lots of different ways. I love the part, I get to do a one-on-one with every sojourner every other week. Um, They sit in my office for an hour and those times are so sacred to me. I I really love them and I get to see, maybe selfishly, like I'm so thankful for the ways I get to see God um, in the unique facets of each kid that sits in my office. Um, I don't know in what other job I would get to do that and I think that's so cool. Um, And then maybe the more silly version of that is I love our training time. Um, we spend a lot of time together as a team during training week, but also throughout the year. And it is not uncommon on like a Wednesday, I come home and my husband asked me how the day was. And I was like, man, our staff meeting was just really good today. Like I just Mm -hmm. get a lot of joy out of that time and getting to see, um, my sojourners make friends with each other and build relationships with one another and see some of the ways, because now I've been doing this for seven years, the ways that has like lasted into their life beyond college has been so cool and i get to see the like planting of that um in the intercultural house when we're all squeezed together for six (laughs) days during training week you know Mm -hmm. um and that's just really special to me so it is the cliche answer but my favorite job is the kids is the students they're they're magical yeah um i I do have a you mentioned like having done this for a long time Mm -hmm. have you noticed like any like change in how sojourning has been Mm. or you know from when it was cmc Mm -hmm. to now like yeah i think that's one of the things we rebranded a couple years ago that's why we keep doing this thing like cmc is now sojourners right um and some of that was just a very practical we changed from being the office of campus ministries to the center for spiritual formation Mm -hmm. and the old name for the program was campus ministry coordinator that didn't make a lot of sense if we were no longer the Office of Campus Ministries. <laughs> right. So that was kind of where it started, but it was also trying to be a reflection. It was my second year running the program solo, and I was looking at um, kind of that differentiation that we just talked about between the programming element and then the like discipleship element. And I really wanted to focus on the discipleship element because mm-hmm. personally that's where I found the most growth. And as we did exit interviews with students who were leaving the CMC program, that was one of the things they named over and over again in every exit interview. Um, was like, okay, what was the best part of being a CMC for you? And that time and time again, they were saying the team and the one-on-ones. And I was like, okay, so if that's the thing that's most valuable here, let's like, instead of trying to push against the grain, like, let's go there. Like, let's follow where God's moving. And so sojourning was kind of a way of changing the language we were using to put more focus on um, the growth that the people in the program were experiencing. So now my tagline is we are a discipleship program first and a leadership program second. Um, if a student comes in and you know their programs bomb and they're not as active as they want to be and they can't show up for meetings and da da da, but they show up for their one-on-ones, they show up for their um, their own growth, and we get to the end of the year and they have taken a step further on their path with Jesus, we've had an A plus year uh, because that's what it's about. It's about people taking their next step, um, and that looks different for every kid. So. I think that has become very different. We put a lot less, weirdly, even as we put less 
focus on the programming, I think our programming has gotten better. Um, we've been able to be more creative. We've been able to be more freeform. We've done things like Hall Chapels and Sojourner Week is still a pretty recent development. I don't know how aware students are of that, but that's <laughs> only been happening for a little while. Um, and I think every semester it gets better because um, we get more creative, we learn more things. And I think because students in our program are really connected to what God is doing in their own lives, they can bring that to their programming in a way that I don't know that I experienced when I was a CMC, you know, back in 2015. And, wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, so there's some of that, right, that I think the more we focus in on how students are growing and where they're seeing Jesus in their actual lives, the more they um, put on interesting programming and invite mm -hmm. the students around them into something really purposeful. Um. <clears throat> How do you see Sojourners being part of the HU experience? I'm going to admit my perspective is probably biased because they're my whole world at this place. Um, but I think Sojourners are a part of the HU experience in that we, we focus on invitation and we focus on hospitality. So one of the things I hear from students a lot um, who are maybe not Sojourners or not Sojourners yet is, oh, well, when I stepped on campus at Huntington, it felt like home. And I think Sojourners in the students' lived experience are part of that. They're there to be safe and welcoming folks for our residential students and our non-residential students, um, to help them feel like this is a place where they belong, where they are welcome, where they can be safe, so they can let their walls down and really grow. Um, maybe more like tangibly, I also think floor worship is a pretty interesting thing that not every university has. Um, and that kind of tangible participatory space for students to take initiative in their own growth is really cool. I love student-led things. Um, I love seeing what students come up with. And I think sojourning, sojourning, excuse me, um, is a really neat opportunity for students to take some initiative in how our spiritual formation happens and lead from where they feel God moving in our community in ways that staff just can't see. We don't know those things because we're not part of that in the same way that students are. So I'm not sure that totally gets at the question, but that's one of the things I would notice. Okay. You know, I, I um, in the past, haven't made it to many floor worships mm -hmm. uh, just because I was in the theater department, and so yeah. rehearsals tended to conflict with that a lot. Yeah. Um, but now I'm not in that realm as much, so now mm -hmm. I've been able to go to f more floor worships, mm -hmm. and it's been nice to, you know, have that growth with my floor. Yeah. Because Big Chapel is also nice, but they're not as, I don't know if intimate's the right word, yeah, but like, no. mm -hmm. with a smaller group, you can be more open with each other, and you get to like participate more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Yeah, that's one of my favorite bits of it too, is that people get to share their stories. Um, and share where they're at. I like the invitational nature of it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> how have you seen God moving through the student body? Hmm. I know that's a really, really I've vague and difficult <laughs> question. But. It's a big one. And when you sent me the questions, that was the one I was like, man, I'm not sure I know how to answer that succinctly. Um, I mean, I think a lot of students are going to be able to point to some of the, oh, what's the word I want to use there? Like. I'm just going to say more noticeable things. You know, we're seeing some really interesting stuff happen with different groups on campus. And I, I love that stuff. I think it's super interesting. And I'm glad to see students taking so much initiative in that. Um, one of the things that I have found really encouraging and, I don't know, life-giving is the way that students ask really difficult questions in the middle of those things. Mm -hmm. um, Again, that's one of the things I love about sitting with Sojourners and, and other students. I have other kids who kind of wander through <laughs> the center and end up in my office, and I love that. Um, a couple, probably this was in the fall, I had a, sort of a random student in my office who was asking me about, um, you know, what do we do with this language of revival and like kind of pressing in of like, what do you do with that? And we had this really interesting conversation in, in reference to um, the lawsuit and those things that are happening and saying, okay, what if this is an invitation to really, what if this is an invitation from the Lord to look closely at things that are broken? And those are the things I get really excited about with students when I think about where do I see God moving? I see God moving in that stuff. That's, okay, how do we press in deeper? Um, not always louder, but more in intensely or more purposefully. M you use the word intimate, I think that's in there too, right? That we are gonna get really 
particular about what we're talking about and get really nuanced about what we're talking about and think really deeply. <laughs> and those are the moments I really see. And not that God's not showing up in all those other things. He totally is. But that's, that's the one that really resonates for me is how do we see God moving in those hard questions and those challenging things. We live in a challenging world and I love hearing, I love seeing God move and students asking important questions about the things that are happening around us. Mm -hmm. Again, does that answer the question? I, I, mean, I think so. <laughs> okay. I mean, again, very, it was a very broad and it's very vague one, yeah. question that <laughs> can be answered in probably many different ways. Yeah, sure. So I think, I think you did a pretty good job handling it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I guess I have one more question I didn't um, send to you. Great. And that's, this is more of an advice question. Sure. Um, how do you think that, like, what is the best advice you'd give to a student, like, trying to balance school and their relationship with God at the mm -hmm. same time? Because mm -hmm. I know for me that's something that is a bit of a struggle sometimes where yeah, it's like sure. I have so many assignments and so much going on that it's hard to find mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I think my instinct, having worked through that with lots of kids before, um, is to remember to give yourself grace because God already did. And God totally asks obedience from us, but I also think God is patient with where we are. And um, I've had a lot of conversations with kids lately where we're noticing like, all right, so you feel like you're not spending enough time with the Lord. and your instinct is to, well, I need to get up earlier. I need to add more things. I need to be doing more. And I very gently want to suggest, like, maybe we do less so that you have more space. Um, and in terms of schoolwork, sometimes that is saying, like, okay, do I, is it absolutely necessary that I take this many classes this semester? And on the other side of the coin, is it necessary, is it um, achievable? Um, for me to commit to spending an hour in my Bible every day. Maybe it's not. And maybe that's not what God's requiring of you in this season. Um, I know for me personally, there have been very long, fruitful seasons where, like, yeah, I've spent time in the scripture, but my more fruitful time with God has been sitting in my car in silence <laughs> for a half hour every day, you know, rather than listening to something, I'm just driving and letting God kind of speak in that space or spending only 10 minutes at the end of my day saying, okay, God, where did you show up in my life today? Um, where did I feel connected to you versus where did I feel distant from you? And so the long and short of it, I think what I suggest is to think about what's actually achievable rather than leaning into some kind of shame or expectation of I have to be doing this much. Shame does not come from the Lord. <laughs> that, I, don't, I don't think that's God speaking into our souls. I, I think that's the opposite. So what feels achievable for you to give to God and start there. Start with what's achievable and then you can press yourself later on. But college is hard, my guys. <laughs> it is hard and maybe this isn't the moment. Maybe it is, but maybe it's not. So I guess the overarching suggestion is just be gentle with yourself. <laughs> be mm -hmm. compassionate and do what you can do and don't focus on what you can't. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for... Uh coming on rooted absolutely um, yeah thanks so much josh and thank you for listening make sure you subscribe to rooted on itunes google play and spotify and remember you can listen to force radio over the air in huntington on 105.5 wqhu or stream us anytime anywhere on forceradio.com stay rooted